Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we are taking a look at the most common pre-war Browning High Power, and that is the Belgian Army contract for them, complete with all of its associated ephemera. So what we have here is the pistol, the shoulder stock, the uh, magazine pouch, and the sort of the all-encompassing scabbard there. Now a little bit of background here. Belgium was the first country to actually adopt the Browning High Power, which is makes sense given that this was uh, developed and produced by FN in Belgium. In 1933, well to really go back, development of the pistol starts in 1921-1922 uh, with a response to a French army request for trials pistols. Uh, John Browning puts together the initial gun that FN sent to trials, his apprentice, uh, who becomes his replacement head designer at FN after Browning's death, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dudion Saive, he does most of the actual work developing this pistol, and it will develop through until about 1930 when the French development trials and the Browning high power sort of split ways. FN has been working for basically 10 years at this point to develop a pistol for the French army, they keep changing their mind about what they want and changing requirements. But the pistol that FN has now is well enough developed that they think it's suitable to get contracts from other countries. So uh, they kind of set it aside to market it as what's called at that point the Grand Rondement, or the, the high efficiency military pistol. They continue to develop more French trials pistols, that'll go into the mid-1930s, and ultimately FN will get nothing out of it. The Belgian government takes an interest in the Grand Rondement, and in 1933 they order a batch of a thousand of them for field trials. Those trials run into 1934. There are just a couple of pretty minor changes that they want in that pistol, and by the way I have a whole video on the Grand Rondement, so if you're interested in this check out that video. The Skipping forward a bit, the Belgian army formally adopts the gun as the GP35 in 1935, and that is the Grand Puissance, or the High Power. Uh, their first deliveries come in May of 1935, and the Belgian army, their priority is to send these guns out to a lot of special troops and NCOs. So they're issued to uh, motorcycle messengers, tank crews, uh, machine gunners and assistant machine gunners, all the guys who really don't need to be equipped with a full-length rifle, but they need some sort of compact handy weapon. The concept here is not just that it is a sidearm, but that when equipped with the shoulder stocks it becomes sort of an intermediate carbine style of weapon that has a little more extended range and, and that sort of thing. Now time will tell if this is actually a practical useful concept, but that's how the Belgians approach it. By 1938 they've gotten enough of the guns from FN to pretty much fully equip all of those special troops and NCOs, and in 1939 and 1940 they switch to starting to equip their officer corps with Browning high powers instead of old FN model of 1900s mostly. By the time uh, Germany invades Belgium they have taken into service something like 30 maybe 35,000 of these pistols. There are a number of other contracts that FN gets in this like five years of pre-war time period. They sell them to Estonia, to Lithuania, uh, to Paraguay, they sell some to China, they sell them to Finland. But by far, like the, the Belgian orders account for something like twice as much as all the other orders put together. So if you're looking for a pre-war high power, this is the one that you're most likely to find. So let's take a look at exactly what you should expect to see on a, a pre-war Belgian high power. So here we have a really nice example of a Belgian pre-war high power. Uh, let's see, a couple things to look into. Let's start with markings. We have two serial numbers here on the side. FN had kind of a weird practice with serial numbers where they would assign batches but make the guns out of order. You, you can't take any, you can't make any assumptions about date of production based on pre-war serial numbers, unfortunately. It's a complicated and weird system and it doesn't give you much, <laughs> it's not of much practical benefit to historians or collectors today. Uh, up on the barrel here we've got a series of Belgian proof marks. There's a serial number on the barrel, but it is on, it's like right here, but on the opposite side inside the gun, so kind of hidden. Uh, and then of course your caliber marking. These are in 9mm Parabellum, as are uh, all of the pre-war high powers. On the left side we have FN's markings, so Fabrique Nationale des Hommes de Guerre, Estal Belgique, uh, Browning's patent, patented over there, 
and we have a combination of Belgian proof marks, which are the last three here, and military inspection marks. That H in a circle is a military inspection mark, you'll find it on the slide, on the frame, out here on the slide again, on the back of the magazine down there, it's kind of all over the place. And then we also have two of these PH marks. Those are the military final inspection or final acceptance marks. So the H's are all done during the manufacturing process prior to the bluing. These two are done after bluing, so they look a little bit different and they'll be a little bit raised up as a result. The sights on these guns go out to 500 meters in 50 meter increments, but there are actually two different versions, and they're both 500 meters. Uh, this is one of the patterns, and it has a pretty sharply sloped ramp here underneath the sight. The other pattern is pretty much flat, and it goes out to 500 meters, but the markings are spaced out all the way up to the front end of the tangent. So that was just a change that FN made during production, and you'll find the those differences kind of just scattered throughout the contract. The guns are, of course, cut for shoulder stocks. Uh, if you're getting deep into the nitty gritty details here and you want to make sure that you don't have a faked gun, uh, a couple things to point out are the divot, uh, the, the uh, deepened hole here for the little locking peg on the stock, and then up at the top of the slot the machining changes a little bit as they you know, come up the side here and then cut that top profile. So you can see what that looks like there, it's a little, there's a little bit of a ledge, and it gets a little bit wider at the top of the stock slot, and that's how it should look. And just a quick bit on the magazine, these will have phosphated bodies, it's an aluminum follower, kind of interesting, and this sort of split tail floor plate on the magazine, which you can kind of see why they replace that, because it's not the world's most secure style <laughs> of floor plate. Here is one of the original Belgian stocks, Early production ones will actually have the full serial number of the gun uh, stamped here. This one, the later ones, do not. However, they do have basically that same military approval stamp that you'll see on the gun. That'll be located back here by the, uh, the carry bar. One of the interesting details about the Belgian military stocks is they were just a flat board. The standard commercial stock that FN made for most of these pistols was a board stock that actually had a leather holster riveted to it, and these three holes were used to rivet the holsters on. Well, the Belgian army wanted something different. They actually wanted a scabbard where you could put in the gun and the holster separately, so you didn't always have the holster flopping around on the outside of all of your equipment. But they still drilled the holes, FN still drilled these holes in the stock, and I suspect the reason for that is an industrial one. I suspect, with no proof whatsoever, that uh, when they were manufacturing the stocks you got a blank piece of wood, drilled these three holes first, and then you used them to set the, the stock on a jig, with pegs through these holes, to cut the outer profile. Then after the stock was all shaped, they would go in and countersink these holes for rivets. So for the Belgian army guns they had to drill the holes so that they could actually manufacture the thing, but they didn't bother to countersink it because they weren't attaching a holster to it. So here is the scabbard that they used, or holster I guess you could call it, um, attachment there. Once you open this up this has pockets for both the gun here on top and the holster on the inside. So you can draw the pistol while leaving the holster in place, uh, you can draw both and attach the holster together, uh, or attach the stock onto the back of the pistol. A couple of belt loops on the back, D-rings if you want to attach a shoulder strap to it. But that's what they used instead of actually riveting the holster onto the board itself. And then there was one more piece of web gear that the Belgian army issued with these pistols, and that is a double magazine pouch. So there are your two spare magazines, gun came with three mags total, one in the gun to in the pouch. Now along with the early stocks being serialized, originally the leather parts were also serialized. They stopped bothering to do that in 1938, and they switched to just date stamping them. This is AC, which stands for Atelier de Queer, which is leather workshop, and then a two digit date code. So it's a, a 1939 magazine pouch. The stamp on the sheath here, the scabbard, is a little bit fainter, but it's also a 1939 scabbard. Shipment of high powers to the Belgian army, of course, ended when Germany invaded and occupied Belgium in May of 1940. 
and the the Germans saw the benefit in this pistol. This was, in many ways, this is the most advanced pistol in military service in 1940, uh, at the beginning of World War II. It's got a high capacity magazine at the for the time, 13 rounds. Uh, it's an ergonomic pistol. It's frankly one of the best pistols of World War II, and the Germans recognized this. So when they occupied FN, they simply continued Browning high power production and put them into into German service. There's a whole variety of different variations of German guns, which we'll go into in a different video. But what the Germans pretty quickly decided is that this whole 500 meter tangent sight shoulder stock stuff is pretty much impractical nonsense. And really it didn't do the Belgians much good during the invasion, and the trend of having the stocked pistols with the long range sights really would come to a halt with the end of World War II. So, uh, FN would go on to sell a lot of high powers after World War II, but they're more commonly now no longer being ordered with stocks and holster and attached holsters and all that sort of stuff. So not only are the Belgian guns the most common pre-war ones, but they're also the most common ones to find, uh, maybe short of the English Chinese guns, but they're some of the most common ones to find with the actual shoulder stocks. Anyway, I have rambled on at some length here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Definitely if you like this, check out the previous video I did on the Grand Ronde Mall. And if you like that, I also have a video on the Grand Browning, which is FN's version of the 1911 more or less. That's also a really interesting piece of forgotten FN John Browning history. Anyway, thanks for watching.